Well, welcome to 360 Yield Center. It's a, um, it's a pleasure to have you come in and, and take a look at the different equipment that we have. We're a nitrogen company, and when you come in, you can see a lot of different technology that helps you apply nitrogen at the right time. You know, we're passionate about taking yields higher without investing more. And what you're going to see us talk about is how you take the same amount of nitrogen and, and greatly increase yields. And so as you look around the room, you can see we have everything from corn heads to ripper attachments to on top of uh, high wheel sprayers, you got wide drop and undercover. So we'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do. And you can see it up here on the screen, you know, the different techniques that we use. We went out and we tested and we said we want to learn if we take the same amount of nitrogen instead of putting it all up front or maybe at side dress at corn knee high in the center of the row, by coming in later in the plant's life. And if you look at the later genetics that have come out in the last five years, they feed a lot more nitrogen later in the reproduction life when they're filling that ear than what they have in the past. And so we went out and we went into 12 different states and 80 trials and 560 different treatments. And we found that we can increase yields by as much as 13.8 or 14 bushel not investing more money, but repositioning. So it's about you and I as corn farmers rethinking how we apply nitrogen. So let's take a look at some of the things that we talk about. Dr. Bilo, he's a corn scientist at the University of Illinois, put this chart together, and at V10 corn, when I'm talking V10 corn, I'm talking head high. It's about as high as that artificial plants are there. And it uses as you look at the chart here, 75% of the nitrogen is used after corn's head tall. So it only took 25% of the end to get it to head tall. And so if you and I are applying pre-plant or even last fall in hydrous ammonia, and we're putting it all on up front, we expose ourselves to a lot of risk. And so those are the things I'd like to just talk about through. If you look at a corn plant, you realize it takes, what, five years for nature, for bacteria and microbials to break this down to give it back to us in cash. John, can you turn me down a little bit? And, and if you look at saying, well, it takes five years to get this into pocket change, and there's a, more than pocket change, one year of residue is worth what to us as growers? About $90 to $100 of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash in this plant. So I challenged our team and I said, I like everything to go just a little bit faster. I said, is there some way we can enhance this that it would do it in two and a half years? And so we went on the combines and we started to put retrofit chain rolls in and it creates chains of residue and it opens up the stalk. Understanding that mike or microbials, bacteria, it cannot get in through this actual, st the, the edge of the plant. It needs to have an opening to get in. And so what we're doing with chain roll is we're hooking chains together of residue, hoping to increase and speed up the time that it takes <coughs> bacteria to make this back into change for us. So we went to a soil lab, and there's a Dr. Katrina there. She set up a test for us. We took chain roll stock residue. We took regular John Deere stocks that come out of an OEM corn head, and we flush a solution over them for a set amount of time, both stalks. Then we measured the solution at the bottom and we were able to document that this residue has twice the nutrients out of it as a standard stalk. And so we're well on our way to the goal of increasing that kind of performance and you can see it here in the field. What else is out there? You notice in the center of the booth we have a ripper set up here and you see some different style points. And for years in central Illinois where we do corn on corn, we are doing tillage in the fall. And I'm sure some of you here, if you're from Pennsylvania or from Ohio, there's areas where you know till this probably almost makes you get kind of nervous to see that kind of tillage. But we're going to be planting corn right back into this ground come this spring. And so we do massive tillage. It's always been an interest to me. For years, we worked at precision planting. We designed all kinds of pre precision planting, designed a lot of planter stuff. I didn't have time to go in and look at the rippers, but I often wondered why would we accept this kind of solid soil behind a ripper? And if you look at it, if we draw it out, you take a young corn plant here, 
and you realize the root grows, it sizes its diameter to the soil around it. So if you were in a sand farm, roots are going to get really large, just the way the good Lord created them. If you were in no-till, your roots are going to be the size of sowing thread. Root diameter has nothing to do with yield. What we're talking about here, it sizes itself. So if you had come in here and done tillage, and last fall, if you had come in here with a ripper, and you left this mound, and you had your shank of your ripper here, when the roots come down and they hit this, they can't grow into it, so they turn and grow around it. And the thing is, when you see that 45% of that soil is, is still firm and attached, it has to make us say, why don't we come in and create an environment where that's free to go? Itself all. John looks like our markers are getting about the end of their life. And so, so we went out, we said, look, let's design a point that would take care of this hump here, and we could take care and knock that out. And so we create a full 12 inches of soil that we can feed off of. So that plant has a good fertility program. The minute you look at it, you see it's a 14 inch point, you gotta say, man, I don't know if I can pull it. If that's twice as wide as what the industry's doing, it's seven inches. And so for three months, we were in the field and we were designing the right pitch, the right degree, the right shape, the right size, until we got it so it pulls basically the same as any other commercial point. And so I'm pretty excited what we were able to do with it. In fact, if you look at that little 3D printer running back there, we actually figured out with certain poly, we could print a point in about 24 hours, we could put it in the ground, we could study the effect that we got. If you look at the response, you get kind of excited. So we got this half of the rippers, got the commercial, same on, OEM. On this half, you can see the bullet point, and it created an environment, and this is down in, 12 inches deep, and you can see we've taken care of the mound and we've created an environment where roots just continue to migrate down. How deep do roots go in a cornfield? Roots go as deep as corn is tall. If this plant was 10 feet tall, we'd have roots 10 feet deep. Roots go out as far as the leaves go sideways. Have you anybody ever told you how many miles of root one corn plant puts on? So if I said 3,000, he's thinking feet, each corn plant in your field puts on 3,000 miles in its lifetime. That's amazing. You think about all the different roots and the little hair roots, and somebody had to actually measure that, but it's about what's it going to do pulling up nutrients from this soil environment so that it produces quite an ear. As we look around, you see a lot of, of corn plants in the booth. We'd like to talk to you a little bit about timing. This is a cornfield, and we saw a lot of cornfields like this in 2015. In central Illinois, where I live, we had two years of rain in two months. And I'll bet you some of you shake your head, you know what that looks like in June, July, don't you? And so this grower had all of his nitrogen on at one time, and he gets into the growing season, and all of a sudden you can see we got quite a problem going on here. He's basically running it out, isn't it? No different than your car or your truck. This gas tank's running out in this field, and there's going to be a tremendous yield difference between these two spots. So from here to here is 50 bushel difference. You know, for Cindy and I, we have seven kids and we farm. I can use 50 bushel. And so this is the difference that you and I as managers that we have to start to understand how do we manage nitrogen. So I love control. You know, in our area, in central Illinois, if that much rain, we saw a lot of corn that was knee high. V6, it was starting to turn yellow. And when you see that, you realize that corn can never have a bad day. Beans are different. You can stress beans at the right time and they'll actually produce more pods. Corn's totally different. What do you think corn's doing at V6 when it's boot high? It's determining how many rows around it's gonna be. So if you and I are stressing corn, in other words, we ran it out of in, and it's out here determining how many kernels around it's going to be this year. And if it wanted to be 18, and because of this stress, it went to 16, do you know the cost? The first thing, if I walked in your field, 
what's your first name? Clark. Clark. So if I go in the field of Clark, first thing I'm going to do at this stage, when we're already producing, I'm going to pull the husk down. And I'm going to look and see if the rows line up from the butt to the tip. If they're in a straight line, I'm going to say to Clark, A hey, student, way to go. So many times you'll go in a field and you'll see that it put on 18 on the bottom inch and then it scrambled and went to 16. You'll see it a lot. And if it does that, each row on here is worth 10 bushel to you. So if Clark and I are in his field and I see where it started out at 16 and went to 14 or 18 and went to 16, 20 bushel. That's a 20 bushel hit. It's hidden. If you're not looking for it, you don't realize it. And so as professional farmers, we have to start to think about how do we feed this crop? How do we eliminate stress early? And one of the keys is if you see where the rows line up. What else would you look for in there? Well, you'd go in that field, you'd want to see uniformity. I, first thing I'd look at Clark's field is see where are the ears actually on the stalk from the top. You count down, leaf sets. And if it's on the seventh node from the top, straight A student. If it's on the eighth node, then that tells you that field's been under stress. It could be nature, it could be something that he might have sprayed, it might be something he did with tillage, it might be lots of things that come in the environment. But you and I should be looking for corn to be very uniform. Every ear is on the seventh note from the top. Every ear has all the rows lined up. But in this case, in this field, this is later on. So we're past B6, short corn. We're more in a shoulder high corn. What's going to happen here? Well, we're going to talk about length and things that happen. So for you and I to manage this correctly, we need more knowledge. We need to know where is it actually at as it's going through. We design technology called soil scan. Soil scan is, has, gives you the ability to know exactly where your gas tank is in your field at any time. So soil scan, you go out and you would go beside the plant, you would take a 12 inch probe of soil. Usually we probe all the way across the row. We start in between this plant. We go nine probes across to the other row inside the plant. We mix those in a bucket. We put those into soil scan. And we can say instantly, is the gauge on E or is it on half? And it gives you parts per million of N. So we know exactly what's on the dinner plate down underneath here. In this case here, it's no secret, we're in trouble. In this case, it becomes a rescue. By having all your nitrogen on at one time, you put yourself at risk. So what's the 360 program look like? Well, we suggest you do it 360 as this. We would like to have you have choices. Let time become your friend. So we talk all the time at 360 about base plus. So we're gonna put on a we're gonna put on a base. So most of us would like to see what between 80 and 100 pounds of nitrogen on. And then we wait. And we let time go by. And if nature wants it. I don't know if I've ever seen a nine inch rain at one time like I got where we live in central Illinois. On July 6th, it started raining. The gauge is six inches and it overflowed that. It kept going. And we ended up with nine inches in three days. I've never seen that much rain at one time. We ended up with almost 40 inches in the growing season. And so by having only 100 pounds on, I now have choices. For those of you, and it's a mystery to me a little bit, we did research at 360 and we found out that 80% of American farmers put their nitrogen on at one time. 20% side dress. I said, really? How can that be? So we're saying that if you're putting it all on at once, pick a number. Sometime in November or April, you say, you know what I think? 219 pounds will finish the race to October. I don't understand how we know what to do when we got eight months that's going to transpire. Because here's what happens. In your field, it's going one way or the other. Your nitrogen either is going down or it's coming up. Remember we talked about it first, about Mike, and we take the value we have in residue, and if you have your residue and your biological system in order, nitrogen is be given free to you. In Central Illinois, my soils, we have recorded as much as 100 pounds before of free 
nitrogen. You understand what I just said? That's $50 for Cindy and Greg on their farm free. If you have already placed all your nitrogen on at one time, you don't get the account for that. If you told me, yeah, Greg, I got 220 on, but you know, I put NSERV in. Yeah, I know. But if Mike wants to give you, if the gas gauge is going up and you've already preloaded it, you don't capture the value. What I like about 350 corn, no one likes 350 corn. But I'll tell you what I like about 350 corn is it makes us all better. I don't look at it as a problem. I don't look at it as a challenge. I look for it as an opportunity. The worst thing that happened to us is $7 corn. Because when it did, it put you five years behind and thinking about where you need to position yourself for success because you become very content. So whether nitrogen's going down or going up in a base plus program, you're sitting in a good spot. Take a look at this young man. He did base plus. He put 100 units on planting. Now he's out in what? Six foot high corn. And he's going to finish his nitrogen program. He's used soil scan to say, where's the gauge? And he said, you know what? I need another 90 pounds. So he's going to end up with 190. At the bottom of this sprayer running through here, we have white drop. You can see it here. It's a base. It's got hoses that run on each side. And now we're putting nitrogen out in the right place, the right amount, at the right time. And what I like about this, well in our case it would be 32% nitrogen and sulfur. I don't know exactly what he's using here, let's say it's 28%. We always use sulfur because you realize the environmental regula regulations taking place, all of our coal plants in our area have been cleaned up. So no longer do we have acid rain, which is really good for these little kids, not so good for corn, so we put sulfur on every time we're applying in. But when you look at how corn plants are created, you've got to get pretty excited. Because if you're putting nitrogen right here and not out here in the center of the row, for the first time, you have the ability to change the yield impact when you apply. We went into fields that were as yellow as that corn that's sitting there artificial. And we found that in 48 hours, we can flash corn green. I wouldn't have believed it. If you'd have told me that three years ago, I'd have laughed at you and said, really? But we went out and custom application fields like that. We put 120 pounds of anon at the base of the plant in less than 48 hours of our time cameras. And you can go visit the field. You can see instantly it flashed green. On the other side of the field, we did an airplane with urea pellets. He came in and he spread 60 pounds, waited a day, put another 60 on. Guess how long it took for that field to turn green? 14 days. 14 days. What do you think happened to this ear if we're stressing plants? And so these are things that you and I have to pay attention to. If we talk about where do we place nitrogen, what if it would get dry? I hear it all the time. Well, Greg, you know, I heard this several times this week. Say, well, you don't understand. In Ohio, you know, we're in northwest Ohio, and it's dry there in August. Well, it's dry in Tremont, Illinois in August, too. Wow. Where if we place nitrogen right beside this root, this here picture on the left, it rained 307 inch. 307 inch in Tremont as your pickup with, you know, hood is spotted. I went into head high corn. You can see where all that moisture was captured by the leaves. We call this stem water. This side over here was a heavy fog in wayside corn. At 10.30 in the morning, the fog lifted. I went out and took a picture of it, and you can see how the moisture migrated down into that area. So let's take a look at some results. Stephanie Smith is a young lady in Michigan. She works for me. She's one of my agronomists. She works our Michigan, Ohio, Indiana area for us in sales. And her dad, Stan, has for years used a colder down the center of a 30 inch row at V6, knee high corn. That's his last pass in. You can see that he's starting to show some pretty good effects when we flew the drone over this field. It was already starting to show some loss, isn't it? We put the same amount of nitrogen on each half of this farm. On the wide drop side, we waited until corn was V12, this high. Same amount of N, and you look at the yield and you say, okay, come on. Greg, 56 bushel, same amount of nitrogen. The only thing you did different was timing. Let's talk a little bit about it. 
One thing that you and I are responsible for as professional growers, I'm not going to let you off here. Let's just take a look at this ear. We talked about if the ear down around the bottom, every one row equals 10 bushel on length of kernels, long. If that's worth 10 around the bottom, what do you think it is on every kernel long? Six. I want you to understand that. So, when we talk about 56 bushel, more, same hybrid, planted the same day, the only difference is this half of the farm had wide drop, this half had it early, and then, with rains that he had, it ran out, and you can see the ear size. So if I walked into your field, and we see that he mismanages nitrogen. Let's say there were six kernels that blistered back. You see it a lot. You can see them pull back. They will just shrink back. And if I saw six, six times six is 36 bushel, I immediately turn to him and say, we gave up the gravy in this field. When I say you and I, I mean this is something you and I can control. If you're telling me by our nitrogen being mismanaged, we're taking that down here instead of being pick a number, 38 long, it's 32 long, shame on us. And so at 360, it's about how do we take it to the next level? And I always challenge our corn, you know, what can we do to make it better? You know, the exciting thing is this, the same numbers I plant, the National Corn Growers plant, Dave Hula, Noem, Dave Hula did what, 532 bushel this year, and you can say, oh Greg, those contest guys, yeah. No. Stan did what? 251? Not bad, Stan. Pretty good corn. He's only 50% there. Because the reality is that a kernel of corn in the ground has the ability to do what? Yield over 500? I had a plant breeder down in Monsanto tell me, Greg, we're at the stage, corn can yield 700 bushel. Right or wrong, we can argue or we can disagree. The fact is, they're doing it. So you and I have a task to do. I'm excited that he's at 251. What does it take for the next step for him next year to be 260 or 270? And it's about understanding how corn grows. Other things. So if we have our corn really healthy and we're managing our N, BSF did a test for us. I don't know how many, how many of you in here use fungicides? We do religiously. Yeah, there's quite a few of you. BSF went out and they said, look, we're going to intentionally take corn and yellow it, some, about that, like that. They put fungicide on that edge of the plot, and then when they had corn really healthy, they put fungicide on, to the row, 11 and a half bushel. So if we manage nitrogen, all of a sudden, it becomes very evident that if we're going to use something like undercover, undercover is what's mounted on the stem there, and it has three nozzles. You notice that we're spraying from the bottom up. So we're down in here. We're spraying to the underside of the leaf because all the cell openings are on the bottom side of the leaf. If we're going to use products, then let's enhance the performance. And so we're spraying up through this canopy on the bottom side. And it's made quite a difference on the marketplace. Let's take a look at a test that we ran. This is one of my fields at home. You can see we had an airplane come in. We're going to spray Preaxar which is a fungicide, it's a sister to Headline Amp. Headline Amp is a BSF, this Preaxar is a chemical they said you can put on much shorter corn. So we'd actually gone in here, we had sprayed it at V6, we're back in here at Wayside Corn, and we're gonna put this test out. This guy here is flying, what, 110 mile an hour for a gallon. And so we came in, he didn't know what we were doing, but I'd already gone on the field that morning, and I had stapled litmus paper to all the leaves of that cornfield. You can see that I got a staple here. There's a piece on the back, there's a piece in the top on both sides, undercover and on the airplane. As you look at that, you say, well, you know, the airplane did a pretty good job for going 110 mile an hour to gallon. You can see here that we did a you know, good coverage of 15 gallon with the high boy with undercover, but that's not the story. The story is underneath. Look at the difference underneath. So Winfield went out and checked undercover for us. In corn, they showed a three and a half bushel response simply by spraying under the leaf versus taking a high boy and spraying down through it, not an airplane, a high boy down through the canopy. And you can see there's no spots here and you can see really good coverage underneath the side. 
And so as you look, talk about fungicide, it's part of our program. We do it. We know already, I can tell you already, that we're going to be putting a fungicide application on, on our program because of why. We want to protect the factory. This leaf is a factory. You know, at the end of the day, all of us are staying in this room. We're corn growers, but really what we are, are we capture sun. If you think about it, it takes the sun to create the kind of energy that we want. The minute you and I do this, let this damage happen, we've broken the factory. So this leaf is very simple. This leaf is doing photosynthesis. As the sun comes out in the morning, starts to shine this leaf, it starts to transpire. It gets hot. No different if we were out baling hay, we start to sweat. As we sweat, as a plant sweats, it draws water up the root system. I already told you these roots are eight feet deep. And as it draws water in, in comes nutrients and it starts packing it in the warehouse. It starts at the bottom, it takes it all the way to the top. And then once the ear starts to form, the ear starts to form, it starts taking it from the top shelves and it brings it all the way down and it comes all the way to the bottom. If you and I are saying, well, what does fungicide pay? If we break this, the water pump starts to do less. Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about by a water pump. In the three I states, Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, if we have a plant out here, draw some quick leaves on it, we got the sunshine on that plant, we got a massive root system here. As the sun starts to shine on a really sunny day, all day, we know we can draw up a half inch of water per day into that crop. With that water comes in the NP and K. And so that's why we're so concerned about when the sun hits these leaves, are all those cells in good shape compared to that left side. But at Precision, I used to work with a lot of Texan growers down the panhandle. And I'd work with those guys a lot. And one of them one day, one of them said, man, we had a really tough growing season, Greg. And I said, oh, man, hope how bad was it? He said, well, we only averaged 305 on the farm. And he was dead serious. And I was looking at him like, boy, I feel bad for you. And I started talking to my ground. I said, Ken, the guys in the panhandle are raising 395 bushel corn field averages. What's going on? He said, oh, no, that's true. So Cindy and I went down. We invested in a farm. We own a farm down in Texas. And so I said, I'm going to go in the upper panhandle, and we're going to try this because obviously something's going on here. And what it is is this exactly. If we can draw a half inch up in the Midwest, what do you think they draw up in a day's time? Three quarters of an inch in Texas in the panhandle every day brightly. What do you think our daytime temperatures are down there? 105? Very common. What do you think our nighttime temperatures are? 55. See the difference? They drop almost 50 degrees. I've seen as much as a 60 degree drop in one day from daytime high. So they pull up. up. It's very arid. It's very desert-like. We draw massive amounts of water up. I mean, we load the Walmart shelves all the way to the top, pack her full. At nighttime comes, it cools down. A massive amount of energy comes into the ear. What happens in the Midwest? Remember 2011? 2011, I'd come in at night and I'd tell Cindy and our fire family, say, guys, we're going to have the best crops ever. And it looked like we were on that course. I told her, I said, I really believe we're going to average 250. And when it comes to harvest, we cut a lot of 205 and 210. Now that, I'm thankful for that, but I tell you, I was disappointed. What happened? We blistered back due to nighttime temperatures. This corn plant, no different my dairy cows. If I have a high producing cow, and she's getting a lot of milk, if it's 85 degrees at night, even when the sprinklers are running, she's just... She's panning all night long. No different of a corn plant. So all day long, it's pulling up energy. And at night, the minute it turns dark, it flows the other way into the ear. If it's 78 degrees or less. If you tell me it's 80 to 85, which we get a lot. In 2011, I happen to have a radio station out in Des Moines, Iowa. And it said, we set a record today. We had 35 nights in a row above 80 degrees. 35 nights in a row above 80 degrees. Took off how many kernels? Eight. We blistered back. Eight of them disappeared. Eight times six is 48. Uh oh, that's where the 50 bushel went. In this case, he's not at fault. 
Nitrogen, oh boy, I'm all over it. But so nature is an amazing thing as we think about it, as we work with it. So you look at this leaf compared to this leaf. You say, if you told me, you say, Greg, you know, we sprayed fungicide before, and you know, I made two bushel. I'm having a hard time believing if you have a field of this kind of damage, you're not going to see a tremendous response. Take a look at it. This is Jim Hedges. He's here. He just spoke. This is his field, pre-Axar, because he's got a John Deere sprayer, so he couldn't go in much higher than six feet. He put a treatment of fungicide on with undercover. Tremendous corn. The field on this half of no fungicide went 230, 229. I can get pretty excited about that. I would have no problem with that corn. But look what, by having the factory, this is his field, this is the actual field it was, by having the factory in perfect condition, 27 bushel more. And you look at that and you say, really? It's real. And so I'm going to leave you with this. We've got to let you go. I put this picture up for a reason. You know, as a corn grower sitting here at Louisville Farm Show and you're walking the aisles, and I always tell Cindy with a smile, I said, hun, if it isn't here, you don't need it. So there's everything from roasted covered peanuts to t-shirts to coffee cups to you name it is here. But this is what I want to leave you with. You embed this picture in your mind. As a corn grower, you better look forward to October. So in a matter of what, eight months or less, six? This should be the vision you have for your cornfield. If you don't envision and plan on it, you're never going to hit the target. You better know which genetics you're going to plant. You better understand your row spacing. You better understand how you're going to manage your nitrogen. What population? What hybrid? You're going to put vertical leaf corn out or horizontal leaf corn out? You're going to put a flex here or do you determine it here? And once you plan that and you start to head there, you will hit the goal. If you're here saying, you know, I'm just having a good time. You know, one of these days I'm going to take the planter out of my shed. You know, the box will get empty, Greg. Yeah, it will. Sure, the box will empty on a planter. Might be a terrible stand. But so I wanted to put this picture up. This corn is talking to us. This corn never had a bad day. And you say, well, how do you know that? Look how the rows line up all the way from the tip to the butt. This corn is planted. This is 42,000 ears. This corn is screaming at me that it's not heavy enough. What should you have? You need at least three quarters of an inch of cob out. So this corn, as I look at it, should have been planted 46,000 instead of 42. So that's Greg's mistake. But if I look at it, did I capture every kernel? Oh, yeah. Is nitrogen right? Yes. Was nitrogen applied late in this field? Yes. I did not lose six bushel. I kept every one went into the combine at the end of the year. If you look at the plant health, you see no lesions. But what do you notice about down in here? You'd be scared to go in that field by yourself in the middle of the day. It's so dark. Our goal is for you, let me grab my pen. My goal for you is to shoot for. So Clark, if I come back to you, 30 inch corn? 36 for us. 36 inch corn, oh, I love you. Perfect example. I gotta draw you way out here in the edges. You're pretty 300. So we'll draw him out here. Here's what I, I'm walking in the field with him, and the minute I see any sunlight on the ground, I'm gonna turn to him and say, How are we going to address that loss of yield? Sunlight is yield. You the goal should be on my farm is 97% plus utilization of sunlight. So I want this to be extremely, so the idea is to do what? Drive the sunlight as deep in the can canopy. For a 36 or a 30 inch row farmer, you're going to look for, for sure for a corn that has horizontal leaf at the bottom. You're probably going to look for a corn, some vertical leaf here at the top. But somewhere down there close to the base, you're going to want these plants leaves to turn horizontal or broad, and you're going to stop the sunlight deep into the canopy. You want to get as lower leaves, as much sunlight as you possibly can because they're pumping water. And they're filling energy into that corn plant stock. And so this will be the corn of tomorrow. You know, I'm going to look for corn in the future to be, what, seven feet tall, all vertical at the top, the last two sets of horizontal, has a flex ear. Usually I plant determinate. This is flex corn. 
If you're totally managing your nitrogen and you've taken all stress away, guess what this ear does? It won't stop. A flex ear just continues to put on kernels and weight and starch. But if you stress a flex and you mismanage it, oh baby, does she ever drop back? And you won't count enough six bushel losses as you go the other way in stress. And so for you and I, we should envision what the fields are going to look like come October 16th or September 16th. And I appreciate you stopping in. We love having you here in 360. Take a look at our white shirts. We'll rent some corn stalks for you. We'll talk to you about wide drop. It's not about needing more nitrogen. It's about positioning what you're putting on at the right place at the right time. Thanks.